So who here is good at sharing? Is anybody good at sharing? And let me help you. Let me clarify this just a little bit. How many of you are good at sharing your space and your stuff? Like that maybe makes it a little bit different for you. you know? And maybe there's some of you in here, like that's super easy for you. Is mi casa es su casa. Like, like there's no boundaries. Like what I have is yours. No problem at all. Uh, but, but I also guess that probably in a room like this, there's, there's some people that are not as comfortable with that. Uh, that maybe you have a little bit more reservation, hesitation, caution. You know, maybe you're worried that people won't treat your stuff like you do, and that's a big deal. Maybe you're worried that people won't respect the boundaries that you set, and like next thing you know, like you're going to be in chaos. You know, and the other thing I found in that, as, as far as me sharing my space and my stuff, it also depends on who it is. You know, at my house, I'm so thankful. You know, we have almost every day we have somebody extra over to eat one of a meal with us, and like we just love that culture. And and, uh, and and my family is so good when there's guests over and it's time to eat that they hold back and let the guests go first and get as much as they want, but not so with siblings. You know, they've already counted and divided, and they know what their share is, and they will let you know if you took more than your fair share. And, and then they're also, they're like vultures at the end if there's any extra, because they're like, they just know they deserve that extra one. And so, so, you know, so it's a little bit different depending on who it is. And, and the other interesting thing about siblings, for those of us who have siblings in here, you know, while it's maybe not as easy to share my space and my stuff with them, it's super easy for me to share my frustrations with them, especially if they're the cause. Uh, I, I want to share with you uh, just the first verse. We'll read the rest of it in a little bit of one of my favorite psalms. It's Psalm 133. It'll be on the screen for you. And, and, and I found this psalm when I was in college. And I was living together with some other uh, of my Christian friends. And, and this was kind of like our motto verse. It says, how delightfully good when brothers live together in harmony. And isn't that a pretty picture? Like, doesn't that kind of make you feel warm and fuzzy when brothers live together arm in arm in harmony? But the reality is, is that brothers don't always live together in harmony. As a matter of fact, if we look at the Bible, like it does not give a very good track record for sibling relationships. Uh, you start with the very first brother relationship ends in murder and over, of all things, how we worship God. And, and that was kind of a moment of passion that happened, but you turn a few pages over and we see Joseph and his brothers, they calculated that they weren't going to kill Joseph, but they were going to sell him into slavery because they were going to get something out of it. Anybody ever contemplate that one? And even if we fast forward to Jesus, the Son of God, come to the earth in the flesh, and we see his brothers, his earthly brothers, thinking he's crazy and trying to talk him out of the ministry he came to offer us salvation. It is not easy for siblings to live together in harmony. Now, that Psalm 133, it's part of this uh, little subset of psalms that's called the Psalms of Ascent. And we've been talking about that through this series. And, and it's 15 psalms. That, that were used by the Israelites when they would take pilgrimages to Jerusalem, which they would do three times a year for festivals. And so when they're on that road trip and they're heading to Jerusalem, they would sing these songs together. I know for us that there's nothing like a road trip to bring out sibling conflict. We, uh, you know, we always say that we know the road trip's going to go well after we figure out who that particular trip's instigator is, and we put them in the dreaded seat up front between mom and dad. That usually happens in the first hour. But we also know that just because we do that, it doesn't make all smooth sailing. And after, you know, a few hours of being together, people start complaining that, you know, someone has crossed the line into their space, into their seat, and it's not fair. And, you know, so what we do is we have to redirect that. And, and I can just imagine, you know, a Jewish mom back in the day on this road trip with, with her children saying, hey, let's sing Psalm 133 again. Remember, it's good when we get along. And, and we call that a song of solidarity that we can all come together and agree on. And so we have those. I don't know if you have songs of solidarity, road trip songs you always listen to. Uh, we always start every road trip with Holiday Road by Lindsey Buckingham. Like it's, it's like before we're out of the driveway, we're, we're singing those words together. It's like it reminds us that we're having fun and we're good. it's good to be together. But, you know, inevitably we get down the road and people don't like the restaurant that we picked or people don't like that other people are breathing their air. And so we have to come back around. And so our, so our secondary... Song of Solidarity, when it's really going south, is we pull, pull out Albuquerque by Weird Al Yankovic. And if you haven't heard that, it's a 20-minute story song, and my kids know every word. So for 20 minutes, we have a little bit of harmony, because it's good when we can agree on something. Now, you may be in here today, and you may have no siblings, and you have no idea what I'm talking about. 
But I want you to know this, that this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, it tells us in the scripture that that makes you a part of his body and that makes us family. Over and over again, it talks about us being brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's why our vision for Calvary Chapel is to be a family that links faith in Jesus Christ from generation to generation. That's what we want to do. That's who we want to be. That's what we want to be about. But it starts with family-type relationships. And that's because community is essential. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be a Christian and then go live as a hermit and never talk to another human. Like There's no room for solitary life as a follower of Jesus. It's all communal. Matter of fact, creation wasn't finished until we got community. If you read Genesis 1, it says that God created everything out of nothing. And as it begins talking about all the things he created, every time he gets done creating something, he looks at it and he says, man, that's good. And that's good. And that's good. And, and, and then we get to chapter 2 and we find the first thing he says that isn't good. He says it's not good for man to be alone. And so he has to create a completer, a helper, a, 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 com- a community member to be with Adam in community. And so he creates Eve. And so, so we begin creation. In order to be good, it had to be us and God in community together. And we see that all throughout the story of the Bible. When we get to the New Testament and Jesus shows up, God in the flesh, come to dwell among us, to live a perfect life, to die a death that is in place of us as a sacrificial atonement, he does that in community because he begins inviting people to join him and he, and he calls the disciples and it's all done in relationship. And then after Jesus dies and is resurrected and goes back to heaven, it says all of the believers, 120 of them, were sitting in a room waiting for God's power through the Holy Spirit. And when that came, the church started in community. Community is essential. But just because you and I understand that, agree with that, have asked Jesus to be our Savior, you know, we're here together as a church, we're doing this together, that doesn't mean that we don't still have struggles. Did you know that sometimes even Christians are not very nice? Sometimes we can be cranky and selfish and demanding. Do you know that sometimes we still ignore or run from our problems rather than facing them and dealing with them? You know, sometimes we still try to do it on our own, even though we know better and we think that we're strong enough and we cut everybody else out. You know, sometimes we get focused on our own thing and we miss the needs of the person next to us. Do you know that sometimes we just show up for the meal? You know, sometimes that we're critical. So Psalm 133, I think, is so important and it's essential for us to learn how to live together in harmony if we're going to be the people God wants us to be, but it's really hard. And so today, as we wrap up this series on discipleship, I want us to talk about how do we properly live together in community. And so we're going to turn to Luke chapter 9. That's where we're going to start. Uh, That's where we started uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago with this series in Luke 9. I want us to land back there. So if you want to find Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Um, and, And what we're going to find in this is that Jesus, not only does he come to be the Savior and sacrifice for us, but he comes to train us and give us a great model of how he wants us to live out his mission and his purposes. So let's read this here, Luke chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Summoning the twelve, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so Jesus, you know, when he shows up, he begins walking around and he began picking those people who were going to be his closest followers. Most of them were his 12 disciples that we know of. And so he went around and he looked at, you know, Matthew and he looked at Peter and he looked at Andrew and he looked at James and he looked at John and he said to those guys, he said, hey, come follow me. Hey, come, come, come watch what I do. Come join me in what I'm doing. And those guys left everything and followed him and, and just hung on every action and word that Jesus did as he went around and began proclaiming the kingdom of God and loving people and healing people and caring for people. But then here in chapter 9, he does an interesting thing. It says he gave them some authority to go out and teach the word of God and to heal people, the things he'd been doing. And it's basically this moment where he says, you know what, you guys have been watching me do this for a while. Now I want you to go out and try it and see how that works out for you. I'm going to give you some, some authority. I'm going to give you some leverage. I'm going to push you out there to go try this. And it's this great training model. We talk about this all the time. It's, it's a really big joke in the Christian world that, that one of the, the most foundational things we do in ministry is we move a lot of chairs. Uh, 
I've at least three times set chairs up and took them back down this week. It's like a central function. I say, if I ever write a book about my life, it's going to be titled, How I Put a Bunch of Chairs Out and Then Took Them Back Up Again. Like that, man, we do that all the time. I'm really good at it. My kids are really good at it. Uh, a few months ago, we were at our annual state uh, pastor's retreat, and my friend Tommy Swindle, who uh, pastors in Nashville, came and talked to us about how to raise up the next generation of leaders. You know, as we look around, how can we grab those next people and bring them along in leadership? And he talked all about chairs. He said, you know, it starts with you watching me put out chairs. Like, come and watch me. That's what Jesus did. Come watch me do this. And, and then for a while, we, we put out chairs together. You know, I'm going to put up this row, and you're going to put up this row, and I'm going to tell you that you're wrong. Yeah, anyway, but, but, you know, but we're going to do that together for a little while until we get it right. And then we get to this stage where we say, you know what, I'm going to send you to, watch, to set up chairs, and I'm going to watch you, and I'm going to help you, and I'm going to point out some things and redirect you when you come back. And eventually, you know what, I'm going to send you to go put up your own chairs while I keep putting these chairs up. And, and, and we're at this, I'm going to watch you put up chairs moment for the disciples. They, they've been through the watch and the do it together, and now they're going to go do their own thing. And so verse 6, it says, so they went out and traveled from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing everybody. So they went out and did the things Jesus did with that a little bit of authority he gave them. And then verse 10, it said, When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all they had done. He took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. And so now this is like that, that debrief moment where they come back and he's like, Hey, tell me how that went. What went well? What was hard? You know, what did you love? What did you hate? Like, how can I help you do that better next time? And it was this great discussion. And, and while that's happening, verse 11, it said, When the crowds found out, they followed him. He welcomed them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. And I love this because Jesus looked at it and he said, look, man, this is a great opportunity because, you know, you guys just went out and tried that on your own. You learned some things, and now we're going to do it again. I'm going to show you again. It's reinforcement. And so we went back to teaching about the kingdom of God, healing people. And so it's this great training model. But then Jesus gives them the next lesson. You know Jesus does that. Once you've got something right, he says, great, now the next thing. And so, so he's, he's giving them the next thing here, verse 12. It says, late in the day, the 12 approached and said to him, send the crowd away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging because we're in a deserted place here. Jesus, there's a bunch of people and, and we have no food and there's no, there's no McDonald's on the corner. And so I don't know what we're going to do. We better send them on home. But Jesus looks at him and says, you give them something to eat. And the disciples are like, whoa, whoa. And at and, and this moment, Jesus is changing their mindset. Because they were really comfortable doing ministry with Jesus. They're really comfortable on those little like mission trips. And then they come back home and go back to doing the thing they were doing. As long as there's the safety net of Jesus for the hard stuff. But Jesus says, you know what? There's coming a time here, guys, where it's your responsibility to feed the people. It's yours. Now, ultimately, in this situation, Jesus does the miraculous. He multiplies fish and loaves. But at the end, it said they collected the leftovers, and there was 12 full baskets, one for every disciple. And he was telling them, he says, guys, I'm giving you plenty so you can share this with others. Well, that begins to soak in, and you know, they continue on ministry. They continue like partnering with Jesus, you know, putting out chairs with Jesus. But then the time comes. And they make their very last trip together with Jesus to Jerusalem. They may not have known that, but Jesus knew it. And I can imagine on the way, they maybe Jesus encouraged them to sing Psalm 133 because they got a big argument about who was the greatest disciple. He's like, come on, guys, get along. And, and then they get there, and Jesus dies. And their world is turned upside down. They're like, what are we going to do? And then three days later, reports start coming to them that Jesus is alive. And they're like, no, it can't be. We watched it. I was there. I saw him die. But he miraculously rose from the grave of his own power, and he shows up in their midst. And for 40 days, he starts trying to help them sort this out. And at the end of that, over in Matthew 28, and if you want, you can turn there, or it'll be on the screen for you. In Matthew 28, Jesus comes to the last conversation he's going to have on earth with his disciples. And I want us to just peek into this and see what he says. Matthew 28, verse 18 says this, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, remember back in Luke 9, how much authority did Jesus give the disciples? Some. He's like, I'm going to give you a little bit. Play around with this. See how you do. But now we get to Matthew 28, and how much authority are we talking about? All the authority. 
And just think about who's saying that. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was with the Father in the beginning, and through Jesus, everything was created. That's a lot of authority. That's how much authority Jesus has. And he says, and so with all that authority I have as the Son of God, Redeemer of the world, Savior of the world, Creator of the world, with all of that authority, what is he going to do? Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Now think about this for a second. Jesus says, with all the authority I have, what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to leave you to finish the job I started. Does that blow your mind? Like, why would Jesus do that? That seems unbelievable. Now, now you may, maybe if you've been to church more than twice, you've probably heard these verses before. These are pretty central. The last thing Jesus says is pretty important, and so we talk about it a lot. And we call this the Great Commission because Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go out and make more disciples. It's, 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 a, it's like the life mission. And, and because of it, many people have said, you know what? I'm giving my life over to missions. I'm giving my life over to pastoring. I'm giving my life over to full-time vocational Christian ministry. And, and boy, and God does that. You know, God did that for me. God, God may be doing that for some of you. He may be telling you, I want you to give up everything, including your career, to be in full-time ministry for me. But I don't want us to think that's the only thing Jesus is saying here. Have you ever considered that this command, that this mission may be meant for you? That maybe you're supposed to go out and tell people about the kingdom of God and heal them? That maybe you're supposed to go out and be the one making disciples? That maybe you're the one that's supposed to go out and feed the people? You know, as we think about discipleship, you know, we've been talking about being a disciple and, uh, and what that means is a disciple is a follower, a follower of a master, and, and you follow the master so that you can learn how to be just like the master. And Jesus is our master, and he made disciples. And so if we want to be just like him, we by definition must be disciples that make disciples. You know, a lot of times I think we compartmentalize our Christian faith and even that concept of discipleship into being a program or an event. I came to church today, check. I read my Bible today, check. I gave my tithe, check check. I went to Sunday school, check. I, you know, I, I showed up and did, did, my, did my duty, check. And now I'm done with discipleship. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus wants us to have a much bigger vision. He wants us to all to realize that he's calling us to a lifestyle of missions and how we treat the people around us. You know, Jesus gives us three modifiers here to explain what making disciples looks like. Making disciples is actually, it's one word in the original Greek, and it's, and it's a verb. It's discipling. Like you are discipling people. And, and all the other words that we might think are action words are just modifiers of that action. So what does it mean to make disciples? Well, it means going. This isn't something happening when we sit still in our own comfortable spaces. This is something that happens when we go where there's people who need to hear the good news of Jesus and to be healed. Making disciples also looks like baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the first century, baptism was a huge deal. It's not what saved them. Baptism doesn't save us. What saves us is the grace of Jesus through his sacrifice on the cross and us placing our faith in that, asking him to be our, our savior. That, that's what saves us. But baptism is a symbol that lets everybody know what God's doing in our heart. And for the first century, it also marked them as a follower of Jesus and a potential martyr because the Jews and the Romans hated Christians at that point. And so you were standing up in baptism and saying, you know what, I'm standing with Jesus no matter what it costs me when you got baptized. And then lastly, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. That teaching, if you read it in the original text, isn't like a fill-in-the-blank worksheet or a seminar or I give you a, an information transfer and then it's a one and done. It's an ongoing lifestyle of learning and applying and learning and applying and it never ends. You're never going to be done growing closer to Jesus in this life. Like, like we've got to keep that process going. You know, making disciples is the central work of the church, and that process, it says, is done in the context of intentional discipleship relationships. Through this whole series, uh, we've been growing a, a, a runner bean, a scarlet runner bean. You know, the first day, we planted it, put it down in the soil, and began the process. Uh, we, we got to uh, we got to the next week, and uh, nothing had happened. 
And we were like, oh no, what's wrong with our seed? But we kept watering it and putting it in the sun and doing the habits we knew that helped things grow. And by last week, you guys were all shocked. It was like this tall, you know, and we talked about, you know, what it looks like to direct and prune. And, and then this week, look, it's, it's tenderling up here. You know, there's some starts of some buds here. We don't have any blossoms or beans yet, but we're on our way. But we're not there yet. And discipleship is the same way. We're not there yet. It, it's a long, painstaking process to grow something up all the way, but it's worth it. You know, we, we've also talked about how the fact that growing a plant seems so mundane and miraculous at the same moment. You do not have to have a PhD in engineering to poke a seed in dirt. All of us can do it. There's no one who can't do that. We can poke a seed in dirt. But when that thing grows up and gets tall and produces food that fulfills a need in my body, like, that's a miracle. How does that happen? You know, you may be sitting here this morning thinking, I can't heal anybody. I can't multiply bread. How can I tell someone about Jesus? I don't know enough. I've not studied enough. I, what if I get it wrong? You may be sitting here this morning saying, you know, if, if you really knew me, you would know that nobody needs to learn how to live life by the way I've lived my life. And you know what? You're probably right. But thankfully, that's not what Jesus asked you to do. He just asked you to be obedient. He just asked you to be available. He just asked you to be willing. Remember, all his power is given to us to do this job. And all he asks us to do is to follow this simple command to go and make disciples by teaching people what he's taught us. That's what he's asked us to do. I saw this chart the other day in a book, and uh, the author said, this is not to scale, because if so, my book would be too big for you to hold. He says, but, but this is God's sovereignty versus my will or responsibility. It says the white part is God's sovereignty. And if, if we really were being to scale, it would consume the whole world. But my responsibility is that dot. And that's probably to scale. It may be a little bit too big, right? But, but you know, God, God's in control. I'm not. But we do have a job to do, which is obeying the things he's called us to do. And when we do that, God grows miraculous fruit in our life and the lives of people around us. And I think Psalm 133 is a really good picture of that. And so I want us to turn back to that today and read all of it. It's actually only three verses long. But Psalm 133 says this, How delightfully good when brothers live together in harmony. It's like fine oil on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has appointed the blessing life forevermore. I heard a sermon about this once, and it was titled, Beard Oil and Mountain Dew. I like that. And it's because in this psalm, the author gives us these two very vivid word pictures to help us understand what Christian community is supposed to be like. And the first is beard oil, particularly beard oil on Aaron's beard. Who's Aaron? Well, Aaron is Moses' brother. And if we go all the way back to Exodus, when God redeemed and bought his people out of Egypt and began forming them into a great nation... God told Moses, one of the first things, he says, I want you to anoint your brother Aaron and his sons as priests to be the ones who handle all the articles of worship. And so they came and they poured oil on their heads and it ran down on their beards and on their collar. I imagine it was like Russ Patrick's beard, like, right? Like I can just see it, oil going down on Russ's beard. Like that's what I see in my head, right? But it's to remind us, it's to tell us, this is amazing. This is before Jesus showed up. Psalm 133 was written, but it's to tell us that, guys, we're all priests to each other. And then the New Testament, Peter makes it really clear. He says, as a Christian, you are a royal priesthood. You're all priests administering grace and worship to one another. Paul, over in the Ephesian, book of Ephesians, writing to the Ephesian church about how church should be structured, he says this. He says, he, gave himself, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. That's those vocational ministries, those people who've got those particular positions in the church. He says he gave them that job to equip the saints, that's all of us, for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. We are all ministers, and that's what we do. We get to gather together to get ready for ministry. You're all priests to one another. And that's why we've been challenging you through this series that the way this plays out is for you prayerfully to invite someone else into a discipleship relationship. 
that you either look back and say, hey, you know, I've, I, I've been doing this for a while and there's somebody I can invite to come along with me or you've not been doing this very long and you look ahead and you say, hey, maybe there's somebody who can help me learn or maybe you see someone who's running alongside you and say, we can do this better together. But you prayerfully ask them, will you get together and read the Bible with me? And, and we, we encourage you to do that with our reading plan. Um, next week, not this week, but next week we'll be starting the book of Romans, foundational document uh, of what it means to follow Jesus. And so it'd be a great time for you to start that and then we just invite you to get together, maybe every other week, maybe every week, whatever your schedule allows, and talk about what you're reading and how to apply it to your life. It's simple, but it takes courage to be intentional to do that. But when we do, I think we find Mountain Dew. Do I have, do I have any Mountain Dew fans out there? Anybody like Mountain Dew? Do I have anybody out there who, like, instead of morning coffee, you have a morning Mountain Dew? I know there's some people out there, like, you got to have that to get going, right? Like, it, it, it fuels you. Well, that's what this Mountain Dew is. It says it's due from Mount Hermon which is this 9,000-foot peak to the north of Israel. And very often the dew is heavy and it runs down that into the arid valley below. And it's this picture that when we do these things, when we live together in harmony, when we help be disciples that make disciples, it refreshes us and restores us. And that's what it means for brothers to live together in harmony. You know, God is inviting you into his story. He doesn't want you just to know him. He wants you to know about him. He wants you to know him personally. But he's invited us to do that in the context of relationship with other people. And in order for us to enter God's story, we have to give up our own story. Our culture tells us that we're our own master, that we're an island to ourselves, that we're to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It tells us to be independent, isolated people. But I don't know if you've lived enough life to know that that doesn't work. But Christ invites us into a relationship with him through faith that then fleshes out in relation with each other through love and grace. And it all starts with me admitting my need. And for you this morning, maybe that's where you need to start, is admit the fact that you can't do this on your own strength. You can't do this on your own ability. You, you can't do this on your own goodness. You've tried, it's failed, and you see Jesus, and you recognize who he is, and you say, Jesus, save me from this. And maybe when we sing our response song here in a second, you want to come and you want to pray about that. We'd love to pray with you about that. But then once we've done that, Christ picks us up and he says, I'm putting you on a new path and that path looks like this. Go and tell other people what I've done for you. And the good news is this. At the very end there, in Matthew 28, Jesus' last words on the earth, but he says, but remember, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Will you say yes to following Jesus and will you join him in leading others to him? Would you guys stand with me this morning?